Right. Oh. You started with the other believers, but the way they took to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. <clears throat> I lost them all. I'll start with the consent agenda. Anything that anybody needs pull completely off of it? Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Do I have a second? I'll second. Any questions, comments, concerns, anything? All in favor? Aye. 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 Again? Well, two of the things that we uh, just approved are two, two of our folks and new jobs. Caroline, you want to? Uh... Elliot's going to go on. Here, Elliot. Oh. Yeah, sure. So I wanted to introduce everyone to uh, formally to Chris Fiola and Freddy Alvarado. Uh, Chris was appointed at our last meeting as our maintenance mechanic. He's going to be our lead maintenance worker for the district, uh, running our team of uh, maintenance guys uh, inside, outside, all over the district. Uh, Freddy Alvarado is our new lead custodial worker. Freddy has been here just over a year, uh, has a ton of experience before coming to the district in leading uh, custodial and maintenance crews. Um, we're really excited to have these guys in the positions they're in. Uh, they're going to be John's right and left hands, uh, <laughs> respectively. Um, and I'll just say for all the things you've heard us talking about, bragging about projects and things that are being uh, done in this district, when we're doing our capital uh, presentations and we're talking about people crawling around in tunnels and making uh, repairs on the fly in the wee hours before the school day starts, so these two gentlemen here are two of the guys that are leading that charge. So we now, you're, some... now you're part of the walk, so you don't have to do that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> these are working supervisors, <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, but uh, Freddie and Chris have done a phenomenal job of uh, helping our team and yep. leading our facilities crews. So we're just really excited to have them in these roles formally. Um, you know, as Caroline always says, leadership happens way before positions happen. And these gentlemen have both shared uh their experiences and, and, and showed us leadership and all before their appointments so we're just excited to see what they do next yeah congratulations congratulations, congratulations. Yeah. thank you yeah. <laughs> no it's i mean right now this is a, a very we're, we're trying to make some major changes in the way and what we do and how we do it um so we're going to count on you guys to to make those things happen for us so, thank you. All right. Let's see. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, good luck. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right. Next is the uh, BOCI budget presentation. Superintendent mm -hmm. Cadella, members of the Millbrook Board of Education. I'm Matt Metzger. I'm the school business official from Duchess BOCES. I'm here tonight really to present the 24-25 uh, administrative budget. An important one because this is really the one that the districts get to vote on. This is really a list of our uh, kind of cabinet members and our, our current board of trustees. Uh, we currently have one vacancy on the board right now. This is really a, a pie chart I'd like to present. We're a $100 million operation when we look at the in, entire BOCES agency. What I'm going to talk to tonight is really between 12 and 1 o'clock, which is about 7.5% of that. Uh, total budget, and that's really the, the non-retiree health administration budget, the retiree health. And then I always like to mention the capital and rental because it is a, I think it is an important piece, although it's not voted on. You know, most most of uh, people think of our services in special education, uh, very technical institute, and you can see that certainly encompasses most of our budget. Uh, just a really a quick reminder on our on our really budget structure and our accounting structure of OCs. So there's really what I consider three main categories, the admin, capital and rent, uh, program and services. I'd like to remind everybody it's a return of surplus. So at the end of the year, when we close our books down, we take the district contributions, which is our revenue. We subtract the expenditures and whatever that balance is, uh, goes back to the school district by the, uh, usually in February of the following year. We, we, we don't have any unreserved fund balance. We do have some reserve fund balance, but we don't have any unreserved fund balance. And I always like to remind everybody that there's an incentive for doing uh, business with BOCES because it does generate some BOCES aid for the school district. 
speaking to the administrative piece of the budget, that's really the superintendent, the board of education, uh, the board clerk, personnel, and the business office. And then the retiree health insurance um, is 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 uh, part of that as well. It's quite a burden on this budget. And we'll, I'll talk about that a little bit further in the slides. And capital rental is really just that kind of maintaining their infrastructure. Do you want to? Do you want questions as they come up, or do either you? one? Um, just I'm curious about the rentals. The um, yeah, one of the major points behind the um, that capital project was to get out of as many of those rentals as possible. How are we doing on that? So these rentals are for in district classrooms, and it's. You'll see in a few slides is approximately $65,000 this year. We have arrangements with three school districts where we have BOCES classes that are that are in the districts. And it's it's part of the special ed program. It's a, called an inclusion program so that they get to experience being, as, although a special ed student, they get to experience being in a regular school. Okay. So we're, that's really all the rent that we do have. Okay, so we're, we're out of that. Yes, I'm not, we're not renting for um, adult education anymore. We're not renting any space for alternative high school. So we have eliminated that. Okay. okay. Good question, though. I always like to remind everybody your, um, you know, how we determine your share is based on our WADA. That's the resident weighted average daily attendance. It's really, you know, it's it's a non-arbitrary number so that we don't show any favoritism <laughs> towards any school districts. It's a state generated number. When we look at the county um, as a whole, it's down about 354. Uh, it's almost down less than less than one percent. It's been a, a trend consistently for probably 15 years now. When you look at Millbrooks or Wadi, you're actually down uh, 40 from the previous year, um, and actually, you know, just just under five percent down. Your share of what we need to collect for the admin and capital budgets is going to be 2.2 percent of the county. So this is relatively good news tonight because your Wadi is down, your shares of of the cost is down. If I were to raise the same amount of money as I did last year, you would actually see a decrease. But unfortunately, that won't be the case. And I'll speak to that in a little bit. This is really the administrative uh, budget. What we have here is uh, the non-retiree piece is, is up just over 2% or about $38,000. The retiree health is up uh, about 1.57%. <laughs> We have about 325 uh, retirees at BOCES. A lot of them are Medicare eligible, which means because we're in the uh, Duchess Educational Health and Risk Consortium, they get a little, little lower rate. So, and they've actually been right sizing that. So we've seen a little bit of a, uh, it's, been, it's been favorable for us to say we ha haven't seen large decreases there. I would like to note you to the transfers and inter budget transfers, you see a negative number there. So we realize that the administrative piece is really the burden of the 13 component school districts in Dutchess County, but we don't really entirely think that that's fair because we actually do some services for districts that are outside of the county. And what we do then is, uh, for an example, we do a service for New Paltz or Highland Central School District. What we've been doing is, is putting out a 10% admin fee on top of what, we, of what we charge them. And then we're trying to bring that into this budget to kind of help absorb some of those costs as well. Retiree health insurance, as I wanted to elaborate on, when they're an active employee at BOCES, they are, that cost is covered for in the service, the program that they're in. But upon retirement, it gets moved to this budget. So as I said, it becomes quite a burden. You know, I think the, really the philosophy behind that is programs may come and go. They may stop running after a while and they want to make sure that their health insurance is covered. So that's why it gets moved here. Uh, it's important piece here, like your district, uh, is your budget is voted on. Ours is voted by our components. And if uh, our vote was to fail, basically we would have to go to contingency. We would eliminate that $38,000. We have to lower our budget by $38,000. The retiree piece is not um, considered part of that. Now to look at the uh, revenue or contributions for next year, we see uh, about a, a 5.96% increase to our com uh, component districts. What we've had is a budget gap for a few years. We've been using the retiree accrual to kind of offset the uh, component contributions. 
we are weeding off of that. And this is actually the last year we've been kind of reducing by $400,000 a year. So the good news is going forward, my budget increase should more closely um, be in line with, with what I need to uh, collect from the district. So we're about $331,000 in total next year. And this one, and uh, Millbrook is up just under 2% or an additional $2,300. I like to speak to the capital and rental because I think although not voted on it, it's important so that you understand it. We have been consistent with the million dollars um, a year to help with our infrastructure to, you know, roofs and keep our buildings going. And as I already mentioned before, the $65,000 is really for the rental for the local school districts. This is down uh, just under 1% um, from the previous year and uh, Millbrook's is actually a decrease from last year from of about eleven $1 hundred dollars. Based on uh, 22, 23's Millbrook's participation through both and that includes cross contracts, you're about a three million dollar book of business for us. Uh, it generated approximately uh, three hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars in surplus, so that was the uh, you know the the revenue over the expenditure that gets returned. And it also generated five hundred fifty-one thousand dollars in BOCES aid. I would say that that's specifically BOCES aid, and you do participate in special ed coasters as well, which is not included in that. But that generates a different kind of aid. That's a high cost aid, so it's not going to be in that number. So really, a return on your on your money of about uh, eight hundred eighty thousand dollars. I like to just you know we like to mention your participation. Uh, Millbrook has uh, based on January enrollment had eleven special and alternative ed students. You had five. Uh, at Soul Point Center. There was one in the alternative high school. Uh, four participated in Pegasus, which is a life skills in the all high school. And there was actually uh, one participant in an in-district uh, special ed classroom. 32 enrolled in our very technical program. Uh, six were in computer hardware and networking, five in security and law, four in automotive and technology, four in the culinary arts, four in the electrical trades, and there was nine in other assorted programs. So some key dates for you, April 23rd will be the day that you vote on this administrative budget. This year, we are also looking to establish a career technical equipment reserve. This would allow us to keep some money in a reserve fund balance, and it would specifically need to be used for equipment for our career and technical program. So my example that I've been using as I go around is perhaps we need a new lift for automotive or we do need a new welding machine. BOCES cannot establish the reserve unless I get a majority vote from the component districts. So that being said, I need seven basically component districts to, to allow that to happen. Jump ahead a little bit here. Um, I cannot put more than $500,000 in it uh, for a year. It's got a maximum of $2 million. I don't think we're looking to do anywhere near that. And uh, a question that's come up, is this an additional money that we're gonna raise from the districts? It would not be, it would be um, basically we would determine at the end of the year, if we had a surplus in that program, in the current tech program, if we did, we may decide to hold a little bit back and put it in that reserve. But as I said, the most important thing is to get voter approved and have it established first. We currently have three seats open on the uh, on the BOCES board. Moving quickly again here. Um, Karen Berker from Pauling is actually right here behind me. And then Michael McFarland, Judy Moran, Karen Smythe are running as well. And June 12th is really for the uh, this is the administrative budget for but for the program side of the house, what the districts are going to participate in. We're really looking for, uh, we get our service requests back, we'll get our service requests from Elliot back, we'll gather all their information. And that's really the starting point for our 24-25 budget. I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Um, if you, or if you have one later and you'd like to send me an email or reach out to me, feel free to do that as well. So Matthew, the, the, um, one of the subjects that's come up a few times recently is removing the cap on the CTE instructors on their salaries. Uh, I mean, I think it's a good, the, the better those instructors are, the better our kids will do. Um, but is that built into your budget at all? No, we don't, we, it, it's, it's, um, it's not built into the budget. 
and it's does not only it does not always apply just to current tech it's, yeah. it's it's every program of both right. and it's and it's been that number for as long as i can remember and, and they and they talk about it every year but if you if you really do the math on it there's not many salaries that are at thirty thousand dollars so there's a considerable amount of money that we're paying in salary that's not generating postings aid. Um, so you know, I I feel like we you know the power that we speak about this every year, and I and I don't disagree with you. I think we'd all like to see that at least at least move up at some point. Well, especially now. I mean, we're you know begging for new curriculum. We're we're looking to have the students get you know whether it's whether it's energy resilience. Whatever it is, we're looking for those improvements, and you can't really expect to hang on to instructors if you're not going to pay them at least the equivalent right. to what teachers make. Right. Um, I'm was just curious if that was if you've looked at what that would do to the budget. It won't change the budget because we have to, you know, we have to pay the salary. So if the salary is eighty-five or ninety thousand dollars. We have to pay that. Where where you see it is on the on the return side of it. It's it's going to be less BOCES aid that's generated, so it really doesn't affect the budget side. Um, I, I may add too, uh, you know, I, be, I became treasurer in two thousand eight, and certainly the career and technical enrollment now I believe is in the seven hundreds, and I've never, it's great. I've never, you know, I don't I remember it in the six hundreds, but I never remember it this high. Certainly, we all we all understand the cost of higher education now, and this is certainly a good alternative for students to take. So. It's it's a pretty exciting time there. Okay. Other questions from out there? Okay. All right. Have a great day. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, OC Spotlight is there for your entertainment. Um, all right. Uh, old business budget development presentation. Oh, Karen, did you want to say something? I did. I did. I don't. I don't want to feel like no. you know that endorsing me or anything. I just said that me and my throat's a little hoarse, so I apologize. Um, well, I lost my voice on Sunday, so um, I did. I wanted to introduce myself to the board and I'm your administrator. So if I can get out in three minutes, I would appreciate that. So my name is Karen Burka, I'm a resident of Pauling, and the president of the Pauling Central School District School Board. And I appreciate you allowing me to speak tonight. I want to introduce myself to all of you as a candidate for Dutchess County Policy Board of Trustees. As Matt explained, there will be three open seats. One term will begin on July 1st. Two terms will begin in April, right after the BOCES vote. I'm running because I believe that our students in Dutchess County deserve excellent career and vocational training and educational programs. We've all seen a shift in education from preparing all students to go to a four-year college to acknowledging that that approach doesn't fit all of our students' needs. In Pauling, our superintendent, Kim Fontana, was a member of the Education Department's Blue Ribbon Commission. And one of that group's primary recommendations was to include more career training and work experience in New York State graduation requirements. So that will be coming. I've become much more aware and invested in how BOCES can improve upon its services. And I want to ensure that Dutchess County BOCES provides our students with high quality and relevant programs that it can attract and retrain and retain great employees, as Karen just alluded to, and that it will do so within the budgetary needs of our school districts. In Pauling, more of our students are attending both these programs, both in Dutchess County and also in Putnam North and Westchester, which is our location, and our costs have gone up as a result. We've also seen our special education costs skyrocket, and both these can and should be an important partner to all of our school districts to provide high quality special education services. I believe that getting onto the BOCES Board of Trustees would be the best way to help make sure that that happens. Um, in addition, what's relevant for us in Pauling and also here in Millbrook is that the third opening, the third seat on the board was because Rich Keller Coffee from Weavetuck stepped down. And currently there's no representation from an Eastern Duchess district. So I think it's important that we continue to have a seat at the table, present our unique interests, being on this side of the county and away from the main campus. In terms of my qualifications, I've been the school board president in Pauling for four years. 
I've been a member of our school district's audit committee since I was elected to the board six years ago. And I am a member of our district's communications committee. I held a key role in developing community support for a successful $40 million capital project in Pauling to enhance our academic and athletic facilities. I'm passionate about education and providing our students with a fulfilling school experience. I have a long history of service in my home district of Pauling. I was a Pauling PTA president and I joined the school district's health and wellness committee more than a decade ago and helped develop programs and policies that have made student wellness a priority in Pauling. Through these experience, experiences, I have learned the value of collaborative working relationships in our schools with our parents, students, administrators, teachers, and staff. And if elected, I will try to bring these skills to my work with the other BOCES trustees and all stakeholders. Professionally, I've been a freelance writer for about 20 years, and I write about the internet marketing software industry. Prior to setting out on my own, I had a long career in the publishing and media business. I have excellent communication skills, and I think that will help BOCES promote its programs to our communities and also help keep our component school districts better informed. Um, I'm here tonight to ask for your vote on April 23rd to we'll pass the nomination. I mean, clearly, I see the nomination, so that was the November, uh, um, March 20th, and I appreciate you giving me a few minutes to, to introduce myself personally to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For Karen. I just have to say thank you because I've been whining at, at the <laughs> County School Board Association. People, you know, send us send us a, a paragraph. Send, you know, come and visit the school board. And you're <clears throat> one of the few that have ever taken us up on that. And so thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Terry. Yeah. I know we kind of feel the same way in falling. We like to see the candidates. Yeah. And a few have come over the years, but um, I felt it was important. And you're my 10th school district, so yeah. I think I'm going to get to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm happy to stay, so I didn't want to just come sure. and speak so yeah. for a little while. And then you're, I'm you're welcome to stay. Uh, you know, if yeah, you're, uh, have a good night. 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 I found it really interesting to see other school district board meetings. Like, it's been such a great learning experience for me to just even different agenda orders, different mm -hmm. presentations. So um, mm -hmm. I'll stay for a little bit. Yeah. Good. Very good. Thank you. One, well. All right. Thank you very much. All right. New. New business. Um, do I have a motion to accept the donation from the? Oops, no, what I do? What I do? What I do? Oh, um, never mind. See, that's how I run this. More <laughs> randomly <laughs> say stuff. I have to apologize. Uh, all right, Elliot. Yes, sir. Uh, Thanks, everybody. I have hard copies. If anybody wants to see them, show them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd rather have one. Yes, I, yep. I told him. <laughs> so, as we usually do, we'll just start with a review of our timeline slide to show people where we are in the process. So we're at the 4 2 meeting. So, our legal notice without our budget amount will go out uh, at the end of this week on the April 5th. Uh, at the next board meeting, April 16th, the board will adopt the proposed budget and approve the property tax report card that we sent in the state. So this is yeah. kind of the last look at our draft uh, before we ask the board to go ahead and adopt it. And I'll explain. Oh, There's a couple of variables we're still dealing with, but I'll explain them in just a couple of minutes. Sure. So, school district budget has three components. It's referred to as the tripartite type budget. There's a program component, and a military component, and a capital component. As you'll see, the program component is by far the largest, and that's everything that has to do with educating our students. So, it's very intentionally the largest. We want the majority of our money to go directly to the programming that impacts our students and their education. The administrative component by design, we really try to keep in that 10% range. So, um, and that's everything to do with administration, but also all the supplies and materials that go along with it, any of the Board of Education expenses and any of the expenses related to payroll, payment resources, benefits, all of that. And then the capital component is everything to do with our buildings and our maintenance and staff. 
all of those expenses to keeping our building safe and running appropriately. Um, one of the things that we were very proud of last year, and the same is true this year, is that our administrative budget represents the smallest and or, or one of the smallest in the past six years. Um, and that's what we everything that we're attempting to do. Um, it's very challenging, but we're happy to be keeping it right around that 10% mark, which is where we aim to be. And again, just for you know, easy visualization, that bottom row there is the proposed 10% administrative, 76% um, uh, program, and the 15% capital. And Elliot is going to take us through some of the more fine-tuned expense numbers and then the revenue and continue on with potential contingencies. So here's an update of the expense uh, budget. And again, just as a review, these lines are actually budget categories and on a big budget, you know, 100 page workbook. Uh, so <laughs> you can see um, the, on the right hand column, you'll see the percentages of movement within those uh, lines themselves. But really, the most important one is the bottom line here, that 1.74%. So we're we're being very conservative with this year's budget and really only adding where we have to. Uh, as a reminder for anybody watching at home, over 60% of our budget is contractually bound or beyond our control in terms of costs and, and escalation. Uh, so for the things that we can control, we're really trying to be surgical and intentional with where we're putting our dollars. And right now, our expense budget is showing a 1.74% increase. Now, to balance the revenues, or to balance our expenses, we have to also project our revenues. And so that's what's on this slide here. A couple of differences in structure for the slide. I wanted to show the board uh, the difference between our expected and adopted 2023-24 uh, budget numbers. So when the budget was passed, we uh, when the budget was adopted last April, at that time, we were expecting $33,976,000 in revenue. Um, what we're actually expecting to receive, we haven't gotten all the revenues in yet, but as the numbers were updated from last April to, to this past March, that number decreased um, to $33.7 million. So we lost about two, almost $300,000 in expected revenues. Um, and that's just something that we have to be mindful of is even right now today, we're operating on uh, state aid numbers from January. Uh, the state, for those of you that uh, have been paying attention to Albany, you've probably recognized that the state has delayed their state budget, which has effectively delayed our um, projections for aid. Uh, very, very many districts in the state of New York experienced a downturn in foundation. Um, foundation is the largest portion of our state aid share. Our district is uh, recognizing a 6.7% downturn in just our foundation aid category alone. Um, the state, uh, many of our legislators claim to be fighting for us to get a minimum of a 3% increase from uh, last year's foundation aid. So if that happens for us, that would be significantly impactful. 3% uh, increase to foundation aid as projected last year versus the 6% decrease this year would be recognized uh, to the tune of an increase of about uh, just over $300,000 in additional revenue. Uh, unfortunately, we can't guarantee or bank on it. And so right now, what you again, if you remember from last year, <clears throat> our last revenue line is always our fund balance appropriation line. That is money from this year's budget that's not expended that we put forward towards next year's budget to help offset and reduce the tax limit. In order to balance our budget right now today, we have to appropriate $1.757 million from this year towards <clears throat> next year. If you remember at our last budget uh, workshop, I did share that that number has crept up from 375,000 to 1.8 million over the last six years. Um, it's not sustainable to keep going. Our goal this year was to bring that number back from 1.8, which was our last year number. That was the highest number we've ever had. And it was directly following a year that we did not maximize our tax levy. Um, so making up the difference, we had to allocate $300,000 more than we did the year previously. Um, when we started the budget process this year, that number was north of $2 million. There's no way we could even entertain that. Uh, and so we've trimmed it back south of 1.8 just by enough. Um, if the state revenue projections come in our favor, that number could be trimmed all the way back to 1.5 or close. Uh, ideally, for uh, the fiscal health of the district, we want to get that number under 1.5 million 
prospectively. Uh, it's a gradual mission to get there. So right now we're okay with the 1.7, but I say that again with a grain of salt because we lost 300,000 in state aid last year from projections to actuals. If that happens again, this number goes back up to 200, so uh, to, to, to 2 million. So it's a concern. Uh, it's a very real concern, and I want to be very transparent with the board that uh, we're being very conservative with anything that we're electively increasing, and there's very few things that make that, make that cut. We'll show you that uh, summary list in a moment. Um, but uh, I just wanted to share this with you because revenues are a little scary this year. Um, the state aid projections right now, again, are, are showing us increasing $197,000 but we took a $300,000 loss. So I have to consider that a loss. I have to come into this budget season recognizing a 4% increase in inflation, recognizing a tax uh, levy limit of 3.22%, and understanding that our state aid could drop another a half a percent to a percent of our operating budget. So uh, again, I did reference the summary of changes. These seven bullets, are the entirety of the changes to our budget this year in terms of significant movement of dollars. Um, we've added a health aid and a special education teacher to the budget. We've increased funding for contract nursing services, and a lot of that is due to a shortage of available nurses. So when we need a nurse for any particular reason, we have not been able to find uh, nurses to hire, and we've had to rely on contract services more this year than we have in the past. So we had to increase the funding for that as we don't anticipate that market to change in the next 18 months. Um, we've increased the funding for public information services through BOCES. Uh, some of that is through our local BOCES. A large portion of that is cross-contracted through Putnam and Northern Westchester BOCES. Uh, they've done a phenomenal thing this year in managing our publications and our public information, as you can, as you're well aware, we've had a lot to talk about this year. Um, and so they've been really helpful to us in that endeavor, and we would expect that to continue next year as well. Reallocation, so that's just four ads. The rest has been moving things around. Uh, for the instructional technology department, we're replacing a tech administrator with uh, a technology integrator of a teacher on special assignment that would really be working on a peer level to educate our, our instructional team, uh, as well as a help desk technician who's going to help the boots on the ground team. Uh, it's currently a team of two supporting over a thousand users in our district. Um, and again, just as a reminder, we were forced to go one to one. Um, four years ago, and when we did that, the amount of devices in the district effectively tripled. Um, so we need an extra body to help support that work. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we've also added private school tuition. Uh, or we've reallocated money that was to for private school tuition for students with disabilities that we've had the, the benefit of being able to bring back into an in-house program. So that's bringing money that we were spending outside and bringing it back in place. So let's talk about contingency budget. Uh, this is probably the, the least exciting thing we talk about at budget season. The vote does not pass. Uh, and you can read the slide. I won't have to read it for you. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of relay the message in plain English, right? If the voters do not authorize a new tax levy, then we have to remain with the last tax levy they authorized, which is the current year tax levy. Um, our tax levy increase is projected to be $844,231. If we don't get the approval to raise the taxes that much, then we don't get to raise the taxes that much. We have to reduce the budget to offset that loss of revenue. Uh, we are a district that only receives about 23% uh, aid from the state, between 20 and 30%. So we're largely funded uh, by tax revenue. And when that revenue is reduced, it's a significant impact to our operating budget. So we have to calculate certain things are mandated to come out of your budget in a contingency. Um, the first thing that comes out is all equipment has to come out of the budget. The second thing that has to come out are all non-union employee uh, salary increases also get a trend. So when that happens, um, you can see here, salary increases for non-union staff comes out to 43500 All the equipment in our budget came out to $192,000. So that was less than a quarter of a million when we had to close a gap of 844000 and so uh, the administration went in and, and picked, it's really a challenging conversation to have to decide what we can do without in a budget that is so lean at the beginning. Um, we tried to focus on things that are not directly student facing, uh, and we were able to come up with an additional $300,000 in potential cuts should we have to go to contingency. Um, that leaves us with $308,000 unaccounted for. 
um, that would have to be further reductions. And the, honestly, um, not to shoot on anything, but the only way that comes out of the budget is in the form of people, because we've trimmed almost everything else. Um, so that would be a loss of staff. And having already leaned out support staff in that $300,000 line item, we would be looking at instructional staff of some sort. Um, and I, we're not in a place, I think, where we're ready to commit to who those people are. Um, but if we're going down this road, we would have to have those conversations. And just to be clear for the board, if the May 21st uh, Proposition 1 fails, we don't have to go automatically to contingency. That's the board's discretion. We can put up a second budget uh, that could meet somewhere in the middle uh, of that 844. So if for some reason our voters did not find that $844,000 increase palatable, um, we could propose perhaps something to the tune of a $500,000 reduction or a $400,000 reduction and we, bid and we vote rather than go immediately to contingency. And if that vote fails, we would have to go to uh, the contingency budget. So here's our budget at a glance. Our current year budget is $33,999. Million. Our uh, projected budget for next year currently stands at $34,591,738, million, a difference uh, of five million three sixty-five. dollars uh, Our tax levy is showing uh, an increase in eight forty four two thirty one. dollars And again, the reason why those numbers are disjointed is because of the significant decrease in our state. Right? We have to, we have to offset revenue somehow. And, and so when you're looking at this as a taxpayer, I can totally understand the feeling of why are my taxes going up more than the budget's going up? And the reason is the other revenues are not going up and our expenses are. So that's the short version of that story. But even there, uh, we're trying to be very conservative with a budget to budget um, increase of 1.74. Uh, and, and that is despite the inflation factor of 4.12 uh, for, the, for the current year. So we're, we're actually raising our budget less than the rate of inflation for our region. Um, and our levy to levy uh, increase would be 3.22, and that is within the New York State tax kit. Did you say 4.12 for the current year? Um, yeah, 4.12 for the uh, the inflation factor for the budget calendar. Yes. Uh, who comes up with that? New York State. But so they project that we'll, out. We'll get to okay. public yeah, comments. Yeah. comments. But with that, any questions from the board? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. First, uh, and I'll speak for myself, and I, I know other some. I know most of the board, if not all of it, feels the same way. Uh, I would will never vote for any employees to uh, lose their job, and I will never vote mm -hmm. to authorize administration to prepare to prepare a layoff list. That being said, uh, let's move on to other questions. Uh, that I do have. Um, has EMTs and our paramedics state licensed have been, uh, been examined to be used instead of nursing, sir, contracting with nursing services? Under state law. We did. We did. Okay. And because they would come in cheaper compared to what they're being paid for commercial ambulance uh, services. Uh, but that, that's for another day. But uh, see, I'm on the Board of Education. If you go to the preview, this is the Board of Education. The top line says total Board of Education on the preview expenses. Uh, since the board does not get paid, what does uh, uh, 68, proposed $68,021 be spent on? Besides the, the owl or uh, that's the argument. So yeah, can you explain? <laughs> I can give me one second. I can't mm -hmm. your yeah. I've been on the board eight years, and I still still don't understand why the figure is so high. Okay, Board of Education expenses. So one second is going on. Okay, so within that uh, total Board of Education number um, includes uh, Board of Education contract, uh, conference fees and expenses board policy fees, legal fees for advertisements, 
uh, board arbitration and negotiations, uh, board services provided by the Board of Education, including our board doc subscriptions, mm -hmm. Zoom, okay. and uh, Super Eval uh, software. Um, board supplies and materials is in that budget. A portion of the district clerk salary and equipment come out of that budget, as well as contractual expenses okay. related to. Understood. Then, since uh, I was unaware that the uh, the board uh, secretary comes out of there, the clerk comes out of there. Yes, as All right. well as the Thank cost you. of the elections and the votes and things like that. But if you're looking for a couple of bucks to trim, I'm sure you mm -hmm. could take off the. Uh, the difference of $772 and use it for something uh, more important. Hey, every penny counts. And that's, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Other questions? <laughs> so how close are you to having, you know, basically a contingency plan? I, I, I think, mean, I know the number, but we have an unfortunate plan. Um, we've had discussions even up until today looking for, I mean, we literally went line by line looking for every single, like you said, every penny counts, right? We looked in every single line compared to um, this year, even went back to as far as 2015 to try and get averages in some cases. Um, noting the fact that obviously things cost a lot more than they did in 2015, um, but really trying to get a feel for what's the consistent use of particular lines to try and make, you know, responsible decisions. The last thing you want to do is take money out of somewhere and then, you know, need it next year. Um, so we analyzed everything. We analyzed, um, you know, even projections for our special education programming, the tuitions for out-of-district students. And, you know, we have some unfortunate facts that if we have to present them at the next board meeting, we're prepared to do that. But we'd really like to avoid it, like you said, Howard, because we are talking about people. And just to be clear, like, there's big ticket things that we're not moving the needle on. So uh, we've renegotiated portions of the transportation contracts to increase the revenue that comes from the revenue eligible lines versus the straight expense lines. Um, they've been very amicable with that process. Uh, we've also have not increased our utilities budget. So I know we talk a lot about uh, sustainable efforts and, and I got to give Mr. Mullins credit. What he's been able to manage from a labor perspective by uh, taking advantage of uh, built loose activities, projects, when people are in the buildings and using that labor to modulate our utility costs, we've been able to keep that level as well. So despite um, climbing costs across the board, John's budget's actually down by $7,000. So uh, th there's a lot of, labor efforts going in to offset things we can't control. And that's just an example of that as well. Right. Elliot, I do have a question. Where would um, stipends, what, what do stipends fall under? What, what uh, category? Stipends are in the, uh, I think they're down in, hold on, in the expense side. They're in the uh, instructional support, I believe. Let me just double okay. check. Um, <clears throat> And not all of them. Not all of them. Right. Yeah. Probably some. It depends on the. Right. So there were some stipends that weren't utilized this we year. We don't actually budget for them, though. So what oh. we do is every year we sit and we um, go over with the principals because some of them are listed contractually. Okay. Um, and we go through with the principals and we look at what stipends are actually utilized going to be filled. So we might have something in fund balance, say, for like not having a particular athletic team. Mm -hmm. So that will go this year back into our fund balance. And if we believe that we will have that sport next year, then they are built into the budget. But there are some that are listed in, say, the teacher's contract, um, but we haven't had and haven't used. So when we go through the budget, we fine tune those numbers um, because we're not projecting to have it again. I'm just wondering if the 33 million, you know, 999, if, are we using every single penny? No, and that's for fund balance. Right, right. right. Yes, yeah, so that's, so that's a budget, right? Just like right. your household budget, it's what you project to spend. Right. Um, and then the fund balance comes from what has not been spent, and that's from a bunch of different places. Mm -hmm. 
Right. So I remember we talked about this a, a little bit more in depth last year, but we have to be able to provide a fair appropriate public education to any student that comes to the district at any time. So okay. I have to have money available for a special ed student to get services that may not happen. Yep. Um, and, and but we're ready. We're ready yeah. for it to happen. And again, what that readiness looks like is more conservative than it used to be. Okay. So <laughs> we're yeah, we could have we, we could have had 10 students in a program and had three seats as contingent, like maybe if these kids show up, now it's one seat. <laughs> yeah. Now it's, we still have a cushion, but it's not nearly the cushion we had. So we've been bleeding off those cushions and that's how we've been able to, over the last six years, increase that annual fund balance allocation. But we're, we were looking this year out three to four years ahead at everything. So I'll give you an example. Um, teachers get are entitled to a retirement incentive. I've looked at the age and years of service for every teacher in the district and who's able to retire over the next six years. So that I know that from now till then, I'll have enough money on average to cover what we think will incur in that line. Um, and, and those can be chunky numbers too, right? So mm -hmm. for where we can do it, like Caroline said, we look at our special ed numbers back six years and forward what we think like, okay, these kids are gonna age out, but we've got little ones with high yeah. needs that are gonna go into this kind of program. It's a moving target, but we're doing the best we can, but that, that cushion is mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I just ask if there's other districts that are kind of in a similar situation, maybe even larger districts with even bigger problems than we could possibly have. Um, when the state aid comes out and here's your number, you might've been expecting this, whatever. Do Is there any, um, I don't even know what the word is, where the districts would write letters to the state. Like, is there any kind of- yeah, there's what one the one word, advocacy the lobby. Yeah, um, pushback, like, yes. if there's parents listening, um, yeah. is there any, you know, I don't want to start anything, but, you know, if anyone is listening, you know, do we write letters to, you know, the governor's office? Is there things like that? Because I'm assuming, you know, we're a smaller district and this is, this could be yeah. not fun. And I'm assuming there's other people because of inflation, because of lack of state aid. And there's other districts in far worse circumstances that yeah. we're in. Um, some, you know, due to really large cuts to, I mean, way worse cuts to yeah. their um, packages, their aid packages. Um, you know, we were really careful in that when we received the stimulus money from COVID, mm -hmm. we were very careful to not do things that <laughs> would then be, you know, recurring costs. So for an yeah. example, yeah. Um, any salaries that we had put, had put into those grants to bring in, say, extra mental health, because we have done that, right? Extra support. Mm -hmm. um, we spent the three years of those multi-year grants moving them by portion into the general fund budget. So it was manageable when those grants went away. Some folks didn't manage it that way and are dealing with bigger deficits and gaps mm -hmm. to close. Um, we are part, I know Elliot, Amy, and I are all part of different, um, you know, organizations, one being like the Lower Hudson Council of Superintendents. There has been a strong um, advocacy um, and very constant, like advocating coming out of the, the lower Hudson region. Um, but really any organization that we work with uh, is making the same advocacy efforts and not just for big, small, it doesn't matter. You right. know, every district has been impacted in right. some way. Board, even the Dutchess County School Board Association, right after that meeting, we had, there's an advocacy so that, you know, I, I, this is not gonna sound nice, but, they couldn't care less about Melbourne in the state, right? It's yeah. uh, that little district, you know, from a few bucks in New York. And, and a lot of our districts, only we would talk, you know, we all sort of feel the same way. And, and I mean, the one lucky thing for Melbourne is we never got much aid to begin with. So how much right. can they take? Um, but we're trying to, like we just did, um, a letter to the state about the whole electric bus mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. There's one about this raising the um, the cap on CTE employees. Um, can't remember the rest of them, but and then the idea is that we can all sign it so that you know Wappingers and Arlington and Pauling and Millbrook 
you know, if we all say, you know, you got to cut the crap right. and you know, help us, um, maybe it has more effect. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, I'm a cynic when it comes to stuff like this. Last half. Yeah, right. Everybody right. that's you know, a lot of our local uh, lawmakers that are running right now, some of them are very much keyed in on this issue and they're making it like the top line on their mm -hmm. little flyer. Like I'm fighting for equitable school funding or you know, increasing a foundation aid. So that is a, is like a line item on the state budget. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we were gonna give anybody like if we we're arming anyone with information. It's very simple. Uh, uh, when the state settles their budget, our aid gets settled. And yeah. so mm -hmm. if, if you're going to make any sort of advocacy attempt or lobbying efforts, just talk to your local lawmakers and let them know that yep. this is the impact of these things that they're looking at in Albany, right? Mm -hmm. When they're thinking that it's just a th ethereal concept of school funding, you know, what does 3% look like? Well, for Millbrook, 3% could be the difference of two full-time teachers. Right. I and mean, that's... You know, you know, we, we try to put things in, in, in terms of people can understand. This, these are human beings. These are people in front of our kids, teaching our kids mm -hmm. and our ability to sustain their employment. Like, that's where their vote matters in all And when we speak about things and we say, oh, this is an unfunded mandate, like this is why it matters so much. Um, for an example, Alex here a couple of meetings ago and she was speaking about the state's decision to, um, you know, to extend the enrollment of special education students to the age of 22, mm -hmm. right? That's great. And we love our students and we'll keep them and, you know, we'd love to keep them until they're prepared to go into adulthood, but we don't have the funding for that, right? And so that extension came with, we're not gonna fund them, but you're gonna keep them kind of thing. Right. So, you know, when it sounds negative, um, when we have to be realistic and say, it's just not something we can do through their 22nd year, it's really because we literally don't have the funding to do it. And they're not going to be extending the funding that's, you know, passed right. on to school districts in order to do it. So, right. you know, some things may seem, you know, sort of callous in the conversation that we have, but in reality, it's because we, we can't do it. If boards, if boards, would unite with each other and push back against unfunded mandates. State ed would be forced. What are they going to threaten again? It's what are they going to do? Call a cop? You know, mm -hmm. they, they don't. They can threaten all they want, but if if unfunded unfunded mandates are not honored by a group and not an individual district, mm -hmm. uh, they would have to listen or, yeah. or do something and, I mean, and make it work. That's where we are with the EV buses, right? It's a legislative yeah. mandate at this point. The law says we have to do this. There's absolutely nothing realistic about no. how we're going to do it no. um, for anyone, right? Anyone who's had a, a feasibility study done, they'll tell you, you know, if it's half of their fleet that they could convert, the other half can't even do the runs and their infrastructure and roads. The companies, the, bus, the building of the bus companies, they can't Correct. Produce them. Uh, it's, but we it's still have to big, do it, right? So this is where we can we go. I know. You know, we're trying to balance this in the best way that we can. The so realistic conversations um, that come to a place that we really don't want them to. Run. They're not always realistic, and that's Paul. That's a big part of the issue. And that's why I think we have to ask these questions. It, you know, I I wish there were more public on there, and I think unfortunately people are so busy nowadays. They until it comes right down to mm -hmm. that moment yeah, you don't cool. realize all the background information of it and you know i just pray that there's people on there listening and knowing that if the whole this is the, the real situation school districts have to have a budget in to be yeah. voted on the state legislature well they can miss the budget they they can raise it they can raise 10 percent if they want there's no cap for them uh if, you know it's what the mel brooks who said it's good to be the king mm -hmm. we. <laughs> yep. thank you Anything else for? <coughs> All right. Um, why don't we? Um, if you could have, uh, the, did you have questions about the budget from the public? Did you yeah. want? The only public guy. Mr. Public. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> uh, I showing up at these houses. <laughs> no, no. I was just. He mentioned inflation. I was just curious yeah. when through that. I had totally different questions. Uh, it kind of crossed over between the budget and the um, propositions you have, if I can ask a question on it for clarification. Sure. Or is that out of bounds? Because this is no, no, I, I mean, I want to. So I, I watched the video on the web that you had done. Is it the Yes. Yeah, so I think you did the part of the finances. 
So um, I just want to make sure I understand. You mentioned one to one point five million is in a unassigned balance fund potentially. Other than from so is that from last year or going into a new budget? So what happened was um, we're allowed. We're restricted to a four percent maximum of unassigned fund balance. That's leftover money with no home. So that's okay. last year's. Then? That was last year's one. Okay. Are, are we creating a similar amount with the new budget? No. So if I can clarify, that was not supposed to be unassigned. It was assigned for a specific purpose. The law has changed from twenty three to twenty four, and that purpose is no longer an applicable place to to uh, house savings. So if we weren't doing a rebuild the school, what would have happened to that money? Uh, that money would uh, either be leveraged to offset the tax levy or could be refunded to the taxpayers or could be put into an assigned fund balance. Okay, and the intent is to put it towards the proposition. Correct, to offset the, the tax burden. Proposition two, which is the case. So going to there now, um, I was just looking at the numbers. So I, I, I just want to make sure I understood. She said about a ten million is in reserves. Ten million that would be applied to Proposition Two, correct? Regardless of whether three or four is approved, correct? And then you said New York State might offer about eleven million. Um, I, I thought the number was it eleven or nineteen? Uh, no, nineteen with the current bonds we have. Right? We that, have that existing. Yeah, so you would just renew those out pretty much. Well, we replace the right, right. Yes. But what is New York State offering out of that whole thing? Oh, I think. Are you asking about our uh, the aid rate? Right. So right. New York State's going to aid us on every bit of the forty to the fifty-five. Then there's the seven point six million in energy performance contract. Right. They're not going to aid us on that because they're going to consider that a cost neutral. Right. Yeah. But well, I, I thought I. Uh, I think 11 million, I thought was a number. I think the 11 million, it's 11.5, I'm pretty sure, and that comes from our capital reserve of $10 million plus mm -hmm. the 1.5 that we oh, okay. So, at, So out of this, so, so let's just take the first the 55 million part alone. Um, what's the net in, uh, that you would have to borrow besides the 19 renewal? Uh, Once so, all the aids in place, you move the excess money over and over. Okay, so out of the four, I'm gonna use round numbers because yep. I'm just going up. So out of the forty-eight, you yep. would take eleven five off. Yeah. Um, because it's actually out of the fifty-five, seven point six comes off to get to the forty-eight, mm -hmm. and then eleven five is funded in cash. But the state's gonna aid us from every bit of the forty-eight, whether we have cash or we take out a bond. So by how much? Uh, about twenty-three percent is our About twenty-three percent. So, so I'm just curious. Is it is it safe to assume nineteen and seven is about twenty six million of bonding that we're going to be that represents the tax increase for that one prop two? Uh, roughly. Let me just take a look. I think I have. So we're. Uh, let's see. Uh, I just have one more question after that. Yeah, it's it's around twenty million dollars, and again, very round numbers. So, so I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. When I looked through the charts, I talked about potential tax increase, and I looked at the four hundred k line item. Um, okay. Uh, I'm just curious if if it's about twenty roughly, um, and the tax is let's say the four hundred k line is two twenty six for a basic start. Because that's what you focused on the video too. And the next two props, two and three, I would assume most of that we would be funding through bonding, two and three. Uh, right, two and three would be would be three. bond funded. Uh, I'm sorry, three and four. Thank three and I'm sorry, three and four. Um, so that so that's like twenty two million roughly, right? I believe. Right. So, so if you add up the, I'm just asking this as a side note since we're following through it. If you add up the difference in taxes for those three and four, why is it higher than? By more significant amount than the prop. It's not a straight line calculation. It's actually amortization tables out, and it's based on when the debts are taken out and when the old debt fall. So they look at it as a 20 year picture. Uh, and if, if I can show you just for a second, uh, I'll put it on the screen. <coughs> Does it look like a 20% uh, or more cost? It, it, it's not straight line. And actually, that's what our, our finance company does. Um, and you can always do three and four later on, theoretically, right? Yes. Is the state funding any of that now or later? When you say state funding, well, eight, eight, I mean, everything's eight. Yeah. Everything is eight. Everything's eight. So it, are we limited on aid that they'll provide? Is it per prop or is it per amount well, spend? The issue is um, so I'll show you here. This is a. Uh, okay. So this is. 
just just to show you a, a debt picture of what that looks like with the the full project and how the debt is. See, it doesn't all hit on the same year. If I go back another, and and this was uh, something that we can have our finance company speak to more directly, but where's the page? Okay, so you can see, like for the next three years, we're we're spending all of this on debt, and then after twenty twenty seven. The old debt starts to come off, so we want to fill in these gaps. That's a nineteen million. That's that's where that nineteen million is going to come from. These bars here coming off the books, and us filling in that debt without having to increase taxes necessarily to offset it. Okay, um, but how we plan this project? When when you talk about can we do uh, four or three and four later? Sure, we can. But some of the one of the benefits of planning the project this way is if we do two, three, and four together, we can plan for the, any overlapping construction. So that if we have to open the wall behind me for a one part of phase three and one part of phase four, I'm going to open the wall once and then close it up once. If I have to open it twice, there's going to be additional construction costs plus the escalation costs of delaying the work a year, two years, three years. So the short answer is yes, the later propositions could be delayed. But also, yes, there would be a, a potential increase in cost because of the time delay and any redundancy in scope. You don't know all those nuances now to know that you'd save anything. I well, know that you doing know that once a is... Twice, 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 yes. Cost per well, I know. Yeah, I understand the plus what, but do you know that going from uh, two to three to four, that there are half of the building that's going to be affected again as you go across the property. We do know uh, some of the scope. Yeah, so for example, um, so if some of the scope, you don't really know all of it. Correct. Okay. But if I'm doing the, if any sort of, any of the interior renovations, <laughs> like for this building, that don't get done with Proposition 1 would create construction requirements because I'm ripping the roof off, I'm doing the ceilings, I'm doing the lights, I'm doing the windows. So anything that I do in this room after I replace the lights and windows, require the lights to some of the lights to come down, some of the ceiling to come down, and perhaps some of the wall to be opened back up. So that <laughs> is it, is it qu easily quantifiable right now to the dollar? No, but I can tell you the line item wise which things would have redundancy in scope. Right. And yeah, I saw on one of the charts, uh, and by the way, the charts you put up I think are the newest ones because the one on the webs I just printed look a little dated. Well, I'll have to double check that. Right? Yeah. So um it said you may in the newsletter, uh, what does may mean in terms of what you send the taxpayer? I'm not sure where, where you're in at. In one of the charts I saw, you may publish information regarding the May, the voting time period. That, um, we don't have a newsletter. Yeah, so we, we just finally. But they use the word may, as if they may or may not mail it out. And I just want to say, because I think I, you're over, right? No, but that's a long time ago. <laughs> anyway, I had a call to see where the normal letter is that you file, uh, send out to us in a minute, because sometimes I don't get them at all. So the reminding um, us of when the tax. Yeah, so that's is. a regular budget newsletter that we'll be sending. Here, you've had a line item that says you <laughs> And so we just also um, just finalized the proof, actually, Amy's holding it right there, for there will be a capital project newsletter as well. Okay, so you'll get and that's when I think this was referring to. Yeah. yeah. Kind of, so you're going to mail them to yeah. us? Or yeah. Yeah. And Tony, sure. my lords, last year a lot of people in the Clinton Corners area did not get it, including myself. I checked with the post office for whatever reason. OCs did not provide, did not make it to the Millbrook uh, post office oh, okay. to be handed out and yeah. to Clinton Corners. Know, know, that should not happen this year. I, I, last year or the year before, I figured pre uh, the last superintendent, <laughs> it did not make it. All right. Thank you. Uh, Karen, did you want anything else you wanted to say that you're, I, I consider you're public? <laughs> <laughs> I feel your pain. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you all, and, you know, Trey mentioned the Dutchess County School Boards. We all pay into the New York State School Board Association. I mean, I don't call into them. I'm assuming they're a member. They do their, you know, there are a lot of groups. So, you know, there you, you see those emails, and I will just add that in polling, um, we vote as a board on whether we want to send a community um, email out that we want the superintendent to send an email out to our public um, 
it has formed like form letters that just click here to let your local legislators and mm -hmm. we get a good response with that. So mm -hmm. it's something that you board might want to think about of getting oh. to get the community involved. Mm -hmm. um, then we come from the superintendent and just click here and it goes to you know, like for us it's like Waller and Ralston and blah 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 blah. But mm -hmm. remember your representative are and we have say it can help us get your community involved. Thank, thank, thank you for thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thank you. New business. If I'm in the right spot. Um, do I have a motion to accept the uh, donation from the MEF of $2,702? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any questions, thank but I want to say thank you. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Next is the uh, seeker recommendation. Do I have a motion to um, accept the seeker recommendation as documented? So moved. Do I have a second? I'll second. Questions? Comments? Y'all know what the speaker is, right? I should say. Did you want to uh, just a quick definition? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, SEPRA is the State Environmental Quality Review Act. Um, the district, anytime, anytime a capital project is, is proposed, uh, before the propositions for the project are adopted, the school district or the municipality, any municipality, must designate a lead agency for environmental quality review. And under this resolution, the board is deciding to do that as a board on uh, yourselves. And this is not uncommon for school districts to do. Uh, basically what this is saying is that uh, the project that we are looking to undertake will not have a significant environmental impact uh, as defined by the State uh, Environmental Quality Review Act. And, and one of the biggest delimiters of that is uh, more than 10,000 square feet of new addition uh, space. So if you're, if you're expanding your footprint by more than 10,000 square feet, it triggers uh, a more intensive, uh, what they call a type of one, a secret review. Um, because our uh, footprint is going to be the square footage increase is less than 6,000, and it's really just the greenhouse and the uh, vestibules for our new uh, elevators. What about the library? Uh, it's not an expansion beyond the property because we're staying within the lines that we took pictures of it and showed it to the environmental consultants. Uh, we're expanding the square footage of the, of the building, but not the property because it's already, already paved. Already paved. Yeah. So, right, we're not, we're not, uh, this is really for like stormwater runoff, erosion, things like that. Uh, whether you're using retaining walls, like for example, if we were building an extension towards Alden and the creek was going to be disrupted, that would be a major type one thing that we have to do all this kind of studies and research to remediate before construction. So not applicable in this case, this is a type two uh, project under Seeker, and it just requires, I believe, a roll call vote with the clerk um, for the board to authorize it. Yeah. Uh, Dina? Uh, yes. Howard? Yes. Chris? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Dana? Yes. Chris? Yes. And Barry. Yes. Thank you. All right. Next is the um, bond propositions. Do I have a motion? Make the motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. Uh, questions, comments? Yes, I do have a comment or a couple of comments. Um, the board uh, has, uh, has uh, went over this. Um, numerous times and feels that we have uh, the district uh, in, and for the taxpayers as, as fiduciary, we've tried to, and thanks to Mr. Garcia and Superintendent Fideller, uh, trimmed it as, as best as it could be best uh, done to save taxpayer money. These buildings need to be rehabilitated and brought up to uh, current spec for years to come. Uh, and uh, and that's what this project will do. Uh, hopefully, the public uh, will agree with with the board, uh, since the board is the stewards for the public. That the public will vote and approve all of these projects. I do want to make a comment that uh, uh, I'll, I'll make. I'll read a quote. Former President Harry S. Truman said back when he was a senator in charge of the Truman Committee, and he battled corruption and helped uh, during World War II while going over contracts 
and, and that will apply to uh, these current four propositions and hopefully uh, board oversight of, of the work that will be done in the future once this is approved. Uh, President Truman said, I have had considerable experience in, in public contracts and I have never yet found a contractor who have not watched would not leave the government holding the bag. We are not doing him, meaning the contractors, a favor if we are not watching him. And I am sure, uh, Mr. Garcia, that will be the case. Yes, and, and the board will provide oversight as well. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, questions? All in favor? Or yeah, never mind. <laughs> yeah. Howard. Yes. 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 And Terry. Yes. Thank you. Right. Uh, leadership report. Just a couple of things. Um, the, we'll be doing the vote on the uh, County Boathies budget that we just saw on the 23rd at 5.30. Um, we'll also be adopting the um, budget and, and public the voter initiated propositions at the 16th of April. Um, one sort of new piece of news, um, Jason, the uh, superintendent of BOCES, has resigned. Um, uh, it's a personal health thing uh, or family health. Um, just to me, I, you know, I really hate to see Jason leave. Um, I think he's made a lot of really good changes, especially to CP. Um, so best of luck to Jason. Um, and I think that's all I have from my side. Chris, do you have anything? No, I just wanted to thank the admin and the capital project uh, team just for putting in countless hours and days to get where we are and the propositions and, and weeding it down and the tough decisions. I, it's, it was a pleasure and uh, I appreciate your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. All right, Carolyn. Good evening, everyone. Um, I do have some items on here that might be some, somewhat redundant. Mm -hmm. So I will skip, I will certainly not steal his thunder for the first bullet point. Um, all the teachers will be working with Dr. Sobrin, our math consultant, on six days throughout the month of April. So um, we just think it's important to continue to mention the ongoing threat of professional development that's happening across the district. Um, we're really proud of being able to offer this in both math and literacy um, and really strengthening our, our teaching practices, especially in response to the global pandemic and really trying to close the um, education gap that was left in the wake of the pandemic. Um, BOCES will be here to support our, our fifth grade students with investigations. So that's pretty neat because this will help them to prepare for their science test, the New York State science test that's coming as the standards change, sometimes the expectations and the tested areas change a bit. So it will be interesting to see um, what that's going to look like on May 9th, the first time they'll be taking this exam. Elm Drive, really excited to be welcoming our IBM engineers back for any day on April 5th, it's Friday. And they will be working with Shelly Klein, their literacy coach for the P2 professional development. Marking period three is coming to an end before our next board meeting. So hard to believe that it's already here, but April 12th will mark the end of the third marking period of the school year. So then it is a sprint to the finish, as you all know. Um, and Elm Drive will be hosting its Blue Ribbon Blazer Assembly, recognizing students who exhibited acceptance and introduced empathy as the focus for the month of April. We've had some additional information sessions planned for the capital project, and they will be coming up. We have created information um, postcards to publicize those as well. But please, anyone who is listening, feel free to email 
um, district.info at millbrooksdsd.org. If you have any questions, we will be happy to answer them for you. I did want to congratulate Matt Sue, who wasn't here this evening. He is moving from our custodial department to our maintenance department, so he will be joining um, Chris Viola, who is here, and the maintenance crew, and also congratulations to um, Freddie Alvarado, who was selected for the position of lead custodial worker. He was here. Um, Chris and Freddie are two examples of the folks who were here before the sun comes up to make sure that the boilers are on running. They check every single building, every single room in every single building, I should say. So um, <coughs> as you can tell, they, they were here and they are sleepy by this time of the evening, <laughs> ready to go home and do it all over again tomorrow. Um, we will be sharing communication with parents about uh, the upcoming solar eclipse on April 8th, and Dr. Watkins has some really exciting information about that that she'll share in her report. Um, New York's finest speakers will be here on April 25th in the Middlebrook High School Auditorium from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Please, if anyone is listening, get the word out. These are really awesome um, parent information sessions. I know there was such rave reviews for um steered straight that had come a couple of weeks ago. And though this is on a different topic, it is sure to be just as informative. Uh, we have a college and career fair coming up at the high school on April 9th, and we will have a wellness fair on May 9th. And so Grandparents Day is scheduled for April 26th. That is an annual event, super excited about it. And Mrs. O'Connell wants to give a special thanks to the PTO members and also the volunteers who've been working really hard in preparation. And I have some information about our athletics that start to the spring season. The varsity baseball and modified baseball and softball teams have begun their spring practices on the field. They're off to a great start. And um, even with all the rain, the fields have held up really nicely and remained playable. We'll see how they make it through this week. Um, we're going to have another tough rain week. But um, either way, they are ready to begin play um, official game season soon. The varsity and modified boys and girls track team are off and running. We currently have 75 student athletes participating in track. So <clears throat> that's unbelievable, right? Um, seven through 12, we have 75 students. The varsity girls golf team has already been hitting the golf course, practicing preparation for their spring match, which they are soon to play. And we have three high school students who are participating in the merged We Talk uh, softball team, and they are off to a great start and enjoying their time. That is all I have. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Question? This might sound like a silly question, but for Grandparents Day, yes. the children that don't have grandparents, are they able to bring someone else? Yeah. Every yep. And just a special adult. I, we it just didn't have used to be that way. Time. That's why I'm asking. I yeah. know. Which is we're, we're about yep. including everybody. No, no, it's a good change. <laughs> <laughs> yep. um, I had a question as well about the snow days. I know we discussed it last time, but do we use three snow days i thought we only used two uh we only used two and if you recall there was a conversation which i don't know why you would um it was a, a little tiny conversation that we had had about the fact that we only built in 189 instead of 190 days so we really only had five that we were oh okay because the, the calendar still says six so i was a little confused probably something from yesteryear Yes. So we're always looking to make the 184. There was some conversation that happened about that too for clarification, but okay, we are correct with the give back days and the days that we've had thus far. Okay, so it's really based on five. It's really based on 180 plus four. Got it. Um, but I know that when you do math the other way, if you assume there's 190 uh -huh. days, then it gets confusing. Yep. So apologies if there's a typo. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay, Amy? Sure. Okay, so I'll try not to repeat too many other things. You're going to hear some really popular remarks regarding communication. So um, this is going to press tomorrow, to print tomorrow, and should be arriving in mailboxes sometime next week. It'll be full size. This is just a, a mock-up just to show, but it'll it'll come to you this way. You'll open it. You'll see the end of the back page. But this is solely devoted to our capital project to talk through, again, those four pillars. So there's a whole section talking through the methods, the connectedness, the sustainability, of the course, 
And on the back page, just really talking about those numbers that we were referring to tonight to make it easier. It also includes a QR code so that it can be easier for, for families mm -hmm. if this is on their, their uh, island, they can zoom in and open up without having to search through our web page. It'll take you to our capital page, which also has a link to the, the general um, budget, just so that you can see that as well. Um, I know that we mentioned the postcards. Did you bring us? I did not bring it back. That's what okay. that's what I um, we, Those will also be going out to notify all of our residents, not just our families within the district of um, additional presentations that we're going to be giving. Um, we did, as, as was mentioned, upload over a break to our YouTube channel, um, a webinar format of our presentation. So that one is just to, um, in addition to our slideshow, give some more context to what, what you're looking at at those slides. Um, so I really wanna thank, you're gonna hear this again, so I won't take a ton of time, but seventh and eighth grade, are you talking a lot about that? I'm, I'm okay. So um, <laughs> I, I know Mr. Cavill will want to talk about this, but I have the um, good fortune of going. I um, wanted to thank, in addition to allowing um, the IBM in engineers coming in for Engineer Week, uh, Mr. Moriarty reached out to me early in the year, and thanks to the seventh grade team and Mr. Cavello, allowing both our grade seven and grade eight to attend um, three special areas through manufacturing, testing, and the quantum innovation studio. So um, there are going to be pictures um, in the newsletter. I got a quick peek at that coming. Um, but I would say that uh, everyone was so attentive. Our students really represented Millbrook so well, listening to um, all of all of the IBM engineers, including um, Jason was there. So we had the opportunity to see him as well. And he was great at doing some of the touch screens in the area where I was near the quantum computer. Um, so it was great. We really appreciate that. And I know in addition to having like on semi here, this is really nice to have our um, our students see about our community partners. Um, this Friday, I just wanted to mention um, that we've shared with all of our staff that it's um, go, go blue HV, you see the hashtag in support of child abuse prevention. So we are inviting all of our staff to wear um, blue in support of child abuse um, prevention. <clears throat> uh, we have hired a short-term leave replacement for uh, Global 10. So Sophie Weller is a graduate of Millbrook Central School District. So we're thrilled to have her supporting our students in uh, social studies. Uh, she sent out a nice letter to her parents, but if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to her. We are still seeking um, an academic in intervention support teacher for uh, a leave replacement. So if you know anyone out there that is uh, certified in that area, please go ahead and reach out. So the big um, thunder I wanted to share about <laughs> is if you haven't heard about the solar eclipse coming, I really want to give uh, a shout out again to another community partner, the Millbrook Library. They have um, been working with us throughout the year on multiple occasions and have just been um, really helpful to us. And uh, the library director reached out and said, hey, would you have any need for the solar glasses? And this is as it's bubbling up in all of our groups. And I'm like, mm, well, why, why do you ask? And she said, well, I might have a few extra. How many kids do you have? So I gave her the number and told her. Um, she's like, she said she had plenty. She ordered like six. <laughs> so, um, so we definitely have enough. So these have been delivered to the building. They've also been delivered for our staff. Um, so we will talk a little bit later about the eclipse. And once we have that discussion, we'll be sending out information to our families. But if you are at home and you're wondering, um, because they're being sold everywhere, because yeah. that's what people do, um, you do want to double check mm -hmm. and make sure that the code of yours is the safe code. Um, so ISO 13212-2. That is the safe code for these glasses. I, I have that in my um, report as well, so you can see that. And you should always test them by having a really bright desk lamp, um, put them on. And if you see any of the light, you really should just barely see a pinhead of, of bright light when you put it on, that's how dark it, it should be. So there are links on my report about that. So even if you're <laughs> home, you can click on our report to access all of that. We have been talking about our consultants. I just want to highlight um, how thrilled I am to have this um, repeated exposure to our staff versus the one-shot model of superintendents that doesn't allow for the deeper dive that this does. 
and it's really provided our teachers time to practice their craft with someone um, with those expertise that can really provide some um, just-in-time training for them. So it's been really great. I've had those follow-up conversations based on feedback from our staff and working with our consultants on what it will look like as we continue next year, because we all grow with the process. So what are our needs as we continue to grow? And good news, the desk review that's required by New York State um, this year for our ESSA grants um, was uh, was received and I got feedback. There's some minor tweaks, so I've submitted those back. So, <laughs> so thank you. Are there any questions? I did have one and then the be for either word, just your pamphlet. Has DPS been holding up their side of the bargain as far as marketing, as far as support, as far as all of what they sold us up front? I just want to make sure because uh, they gave us a lot of uh, information. I think the picture piece is hard to do. Um, yeah. They took a ton of existing condition photos and we did share them with our publisher or our publication folks. So uh, the pictures that are in there either came from us or VBS. A lot of them came from VBS. Um, okay. So, you know, in terms of asking them to design things for publication, we've been leaning on our people to do that, and I think they've done a great job of it. Yeah, again, Laura Christine, who I'm going to work with, Cheryl, to schedule a time, she's our communications specialist. She did such a great job working with myself, with Caroline, with Elliot, with Cheryl, just to talk to us as the, the core team and um, craft that into stories and particularly aligned with the pillars to interview students and whatnot. So. I, I really um, owe it to her to putting that literary um, spin on it where we become very analytical sometimes. Um, she was able to craft it in. And, I, and you guys have done amazing. I'm just saying as far as them being, they do this for a living, knowing yeah. you know yeah. what the public's looking for, what information yeah. they want, what everything else. I just want, want to know we're getting the support that they sold us. Yeah. They, they've given us everything we've asked. Uh, and I think when we get into the... Um, Post referendum phase, hopefully with a positive vote, you're going to see a lot more of their uh, physical work. Yeah, no, I, I don't doubt that. It's it's more of showing the public everything they want to see. That's mm -hmm. all. I just want to make sure that. They're... Yep. Okay. Thank you for the library because the Pleasant Valley Library had glasses today and they were all gone. So that's really yeah. great yeah. that they have them. Yeah. The Millbrook Library. The Millbrook Library. Yeah. Well, it's Pleasant Valley because I live. Um, said that they would have glasses today, and I went today at maybe five o'clock, and she's like, "We sold out. We're gone. If they're done, yeah." So yeah, that's they're, great. They're, they're 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 still giving it. Yeah, they I think they okay for today. Yeah, yeah. and right. how will how will this be <laughs> distributed? Will they be given to the children before they leave? So the, my hope and yeah. what I asked for. Okay, how this goes. Um, I, I sent them to the building over and um, asked that they be distributed to the classroom teachers to be distributed before dismissal. Okay. And um, thank you to Mr. Porta, who I didn't mention, uh, I might have had it in my report, but Mr. Porta sent out a plethora of resources for K through 12 um, for all levels on how to talk to students about um, the solar eclipse and safety and what's involved, but we still would um, ask parents to do the same. But yes, that's the plan is not to do it before the 8th because then we're afraid right. that after right. the they <laughs> might go missing. Right. Uh -huh. So it's kind of like to the last minute because that might get stopped and ripped in a book bag. Or become the next day fashion trip. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it, is good. it is. It's pretty fancy. Anything else? Thank you. Yeah. Um, next is supposed to be John um, Mullins, but um, I'm going to uh, skip that one. His report is there. Um, I just had one question. Did we ever figure out how, who, when somebody um, bent in, broke, backed into the light in the parking lot? We were able that? to identify the the vehicle on the country with the plate, but we couldn't identify the person. All right. And is it is it that's all resolved? Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Uh, anything else? Elliot, how how did they not drive six past six different other cameras? I can understand yes. the point of contact of where it was, but leaving we have other cameras set up. I would think the same vehicle would be parked out there multiple days and we just walked out the crimes. Right. Yeah. Before that. Uh, I was just uh -huh. and, yeah. It, it's it's hard to speak to in public session without no, 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 the other placement of the devices, but uh -huh. I would say that it, it was challenging to decide. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Anything? No? Yes. Uh, 
uh, Steve. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, a lot of stuff I'm going to talk about uh, has already been said, but I want to highlight it from a different uh, avenue. Um, on behalf of all the building principals, uh, every month we put out our monthly newsletters. We've worked really hard to try to get those communications out and standardize them. Um, so I definitely encourage everybody here to just keep your eyes out for those monthly newsletters because while I have or building principals only come here every other board meeting, uh, much of the information we're giving you is what we are giving to all our parents and all of our students uh, when applicable. Um, so that's something that definitely look out for. And it certainly comes to more life because we have the pictures that allow you to really see the kids in action uh, living on these things we're talking about. Um, so much to what Amy was talking about, um, it's been really great to see all of these people who have been working with our teachers. The part I want to highlight um, has been in my walkthroughs that I've done either with Amy herself or on your own or even with other people in the building. It's been really nice to see that the work that's been happening with these folks that we've brought in to work with our teachers coming to life in the classroom. Um, so I won't name a specific person, but you know, I know that uh, Garrett, for example, has been working with our ELA department and in some areas where they've been focusing on different things and they personalize that learning experience for the teachers, for their classrooms. Uh, I've been seeing it come out and it's really nice. We've had some teachers who are just really excited about the work and the way it's really pushing what they're doing in the classroom. So that's been really great. Um, I just want to speak too about uh, the teachers, definitely here at the middle school, uh, but I've also seen numbers of them as well. Uh, the work with Ruler has been absolutely beautiful. Um, our teachers have really gotten to know our students in a different way in uh, doing these building block lessons. So as we continue to finalize the building block lessons as we move to next year, and we start doing the grade level specific lessons, especially starting it right from the beginning of the year <laughs> of that. And as they build on each year, um, I think it's just going to be another layer to the relationships that we build with our students. And we've already been seeing, seeing big, huge differences. So that's really positive. Um, I want to give a big shout out to the math, ELA, and grade eight science teachers um, with state testing, as we know. Um, often we have many uh, families who refuse the state exam, uh, but one thing we pride ourselves here in Millbrook is having personalized learning for all our individual students. To do that, uh, we have to have the data and the information uh, to be able to do that. So what these folks have done, and this has happened at every grade level, as uh, the middle school as well as at Alden, uh, where we have created assignments for students to work on should they choose to refuse the exam. So these assignments, while the exam is going on, should a family or a child reviews the exam, they're going to be able to be doing work that's going to give us data and information about them. That is the kind of information we need kids so that we can then continue to personalize their learning in those areas of math, ELA, and eighth grade science. Mm -hmm. So that's been really great. And we're really excited. Um, that communication has gone out to families and will be reiterated once again um, in the news that are coming up this month. Uh, as far as safety, uh, tomorrow, the district safety team meeting, uh, which we're going to be meeting uh, with our folks over at OCs, they always attend those with us. Uh, we're excited that we are going to be hosting a, a special safety drill, much similar to the one we did about I think, three years ago. All the place will be assisting us. Their uh, uh, emergency response team will join us to help with a uh, reunification drill for our sixth and eighth graders. We're not doing seventh graders because they will be in Philadelphia. So we will now be doing two thirds of the building as opposed to one third that we did the last time. Uh, so we are working with planning with Mr. Guglieri as well as his doses team. So that's always exciting work uh, because we are always on the cutting edge of safety here at Norwalk. Um, as far as all the events, uh, one thing you will notice in all of these bu bullets is just the amount of uh, this educational family that we have here. I can't say enough about whether it's what MEF does, what the library does, what the PTO does, uh, what our community members do, our families. In every event that we've had here, whether it be the National Junior Honor Society recognition, the STEAM Fair, um, the Steered Straight, again, I, I can't say how positive uh, that was for our students and our staff. They had so many good things to say. And I definitely want to plug all parents when we have them to reiterate what Caroline said. The more parents we can get to come out to these events at night, um, anything you guys can do as people in the community to tell parents how important these things are. Um, they're just really great. And uh, Mr. DeLeon was very impactful uh, for many of our students and staff members. Uh, finally, uh, you'll also see, we just have a lot of stuff going on. So uh, obviously our Miozum concert was great. 
And Ms. DeRosa came down with our high school students for global games. Uh, it's been a yearly tradition where they come down and bring social studies students. So that was also a wonderful thing. And then the, the real big, really cool highlight that I just want to add to what Dr. Watkins said about our trip to IBM um, and something that just really resonated with me was as our students were there at IBM and they're going through all these different things that they're doing, obviously they're oohing in their eye and it's cool and it's different. Um, it was really cool to hear our students talk about how these were things like you're in our makerspace or like in our science classes that let them see how stuff that they learn in middle school really can become what they do in the real world or where it occurs in the real world. Um, and then the, bi the biggest, coolest thing is that um, we were told we are one of the only, if only, middle schoolers uh, that would ever be in the same room as the quantum computer. Um, so that is a really, really cool fact. Really our, cool. our middle schoolers left and going, well, we're the only people to ever be around this computer. Um, and, you know, the anecdote was that back when computers started, those desktops, they were in rooms this big, right? Now they sit in little laptops and even in our cell phones. This quantum computer is in a room this big. And for our students, one day, 10 years, 20 years down the road, when they see those tech quantum computing happening in their phone or in somewhere else, um, they're going to remember they were in that room. So I think that's what education is all about, uh, is those cool moments that you remember. And uh, happy to say our middle school students are doing that. So look out for all of our newsletters, not just the middle school. They all will be coming out this week. Good. Questions, comments? Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Of course. Yeah. All right. Where are we? Um, future agenda. I don't know if you guys know the deal. Um, yeah, public comment. Anything on online? No. No. Um, Uh, next is executive session. Um, just for those that might be online or should be or would be. Um, just because we go to executive session doesn't mean the meeting is over. In fact, many times we have to discuss stuff in executive session, but then come back to take action in public session, in public session. Um, with that, do I have a motion to go to executive session? So moved. Do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. Any against? 